All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Patapsco Wildlife, Land, Water, and Air, a wildlife webinar presented by Hannah Zinnert and myself, DJ Shekelhoff of Patapsco Heritage Greenway. So PHG is a local nonprofit organization. Uh, we're based in historic Ellicott City, and we provide both uh, historic and environmental stewardship for the Patapsco Valley. This often takes the form of volunteer-based events such as stream cleanups, invasive plant removals, and tree plantings. And when we can, we like to offer educational workshops like this webinar as well. All right, to get started here, I'm going to go over a quick and very important environmental concept in uh, our modern ecosystems and talk about native species. Um, if you've been to our recent webinars, you probably already are familiar with this concept, but it also applies to uh, wildlife in our area. And it's very important in our modern ecosystem and environmental work. Um, so we're gonna start off talking about native species. Um, native species are organisms that have been a part of a specific ecosystem and evolved in that area over hundreds of thousands of years. This means that they have been interacting with and evolving around the same group of plants and animals this in, almost this entire time. And it allows them to interact with each other and effectively balance the ecosystem in this area through nutrient cycling, um, seed dispersal, um, you have prey, predator prey relationships. It allows everything to work well together. Non-native organisms are organisms that have been introduced to an area outside of its natural range. Um, they've been moved to a new area they did not evolve in, and this can happen uh, intentionally or accidentally. Almost all the time, it's done by humans, and this can be the form of, you know, insects um, being in wood or lumber that gets transported across state lines or even internationally or it can be things catching a ride on certain various modes of transportation, um, you know, planes, boats, um, and then these species are introduced in new areas. It can also be done intentionally when people try and introduce a new species to a new area for some desired effect, whether that is, you know, hunting, fishing, you know, they're trying to provide a new resource in a new area. Um, unfortunately, some non-native organisms become invasive organisms, um, and these are species that are both non-native and often able to grow quickly, um, outcompete native counterparts, and spread all over an area to the point of disrupting ecosystems. Um, these species, when introduced to a new area, don't have any checks on their population. You know, they have no predators keeping them in control. Um, so they're able to grow and multiply very quickly and overwhelm their native counterparts, which just have a tougher time expanding in that, in that way. Um, that can disrupt the local ecosystem and um, interfere with the balance and ecosystem services that their native counterparts can provide. So a good example of a native species for Maryland is the gray squirrel. Uh, it's a mammal native to Maryland and it plays very important roles in our ecosystem. Um, it's part of the food chain. It provides a source of prey for larger mammals and other animals, um, but kind of unique to the squirrel, it uh, is a very good method of seed dispersal for native plants and trees. Uh, squirrels have a habit of burying nuts and seeds in the warmer months to store food for the winter, um, but they always end up bearing more than they can actually eat or find when the time comes, making them furry little tree planters, uh, which is great for Maryland trees and plants, helping to spread them into areas where they can then grow and continue to boost our ecosystem. Example of a invasive species that is currently knocking on the door of the Patapsco watershed is the snakehead fish. Um, these are very interesting 
invasive species and are proving very challenging to combat. Um, the snakehead actually can traverse stretches of land. It can crawl out of its water habitat and along land to traverse certain areas, find new areas of water, new habitat, new ponds, new rivers, and this allows it to expand very rapidly throughout an area. Unfortunately, they've been seen in the tidal Patapsco recently. As recent as this season, um, there have been various sightings reported and they're likely to spread throughout the Patapsco as well. Um, because the snakehead is introduced, there are no species in Maryland that naturally eat it. Um, and this allows it to you know, continue to reproduce and just build and build its numbers. Um, and with left unchecked, they can overwhelm the native fish and take over these um, local ecosystems and produce a pretty significant burden on the sources of food that they use and every other animal around them. All right, moving on to mammals. This is probably gonna be a favorite for a lot of people here. Um, everyone loves uh, furry, cute animals and mammals, pretty great. Um, of course, we have white-tailed deer, uh, red fox, raccoons. Um, a lesser known mammal, the Patapsco, is the bobcat. Um, pictured here is a beautiful creature, um, very hard to spot. Um, I've been told that you might have a better chance if you can get out really early into some areas and uh, very quietly um, observe and keep an eye out for these guys, but uh, I would really like to find one in the wild myself. Um, coyotes are an animal that has been spreading into this area. Um, rabbits and also you have bats, a very important animal, bats. The red fox, um, fun fact, they can hear very low frequency sounds. Um, so a fox can actually hear small rodents or mammals like uh, moles digging underground, uh, which allows them to find, stalk, and eventually pounce on their prey, as you see in this picture. They have a very you know, iconic pounce that comes from this uh, method of hunting and locating prey. Coyotes. Um, very fascinating animal. Um, they are one of the most adaptable creatures and uh, have been able to use this to take advantage of humans encroaching on habitat in general. And um, this allows them to survive and even thrive in a lot of the new spaces that humans have created. Um, very interesting fact, uh, coyotes have developed fission fusion behavior. Um, which means that as opposed to some of their other counterparts, such as wolves, who very strictly operate and hunt in packs, um, coyotes have the ability to hunt alone and operate as an individual or hunt as a pack. Um, and they'll change their behavior depending on the resources around them. So if it's an area with a lot of humans and not a whole lot of uh, natural space for them to operate in. A coyote can inhabit this area and live as an individual. But if they're living in an area with more abundant food or larger food sources, such as um, deer or you know larger herbivores, they can operate as a pack and still successfully bring down these um, herbivores as a source of food. Another popular mammal here, the eastern cottontail. Um, fun fact, rabbit's teeth actually grow continuously throughout their entire life and they are very dependent on constant wear um, as they eat and gnaw on various things to keep wearing these teeth down as they um, continue through their lives to make sure the teeth don't get too large or out of shape and they can become uh, unuseful for eating. The little brown bat is a important native bat species in Maryland. Um, oftentimes people forget that bats are mammals, um, but they are, and they are very important mammals. Um, fun fact, 
that a little brown bat can catch up to 1,200 insects in a single hour, which is mind boggling when you think about it. And these little guys, you know, can go out all evening hunting mosquitoes, insects, gnats, all the insects that we love to hate um, and really are important in keeping a check on those populations. Um, brown, little brown bats in particular can live more than 30 years and uh, that really <laughs> adds up when you think about how um, thousands of insects a night, every night for 30 years, it helps keep our mosquito populations down and helps us enjoy our evening. So um, please don't be afraid of bats. Um, they really aren't posing a threat to us as humans and they're very important for our ecosystem. Um, so things to keep in mind around mammals. Um, as with all wildlife, I'm gonna repeat this a couple times throughout this presentation, but it's very important to be respectful and keep your distance. Um, there are oftentimes examples of wildlife that have lost their fear of humans. Often these examples are mammals. Um, they can be deer or squirrels that have, you know, been fed by humans um, over time and have lost their fear and will readily approach you. But it's very important to keep your distance. Um, do not approach these animals. Um, it's not good for them and it's not good for you, as cues they may be. Also, watch out for examples such as these um, animals that are not afraid of humans or may seem bold or, you know, coming out during rare times of day, like broad daylight and just seem to be kind of brazenly walking around um, can be a sign or indicator that that animal is diseased or unhealthy. And it's a, another very important reason to keep your distance. Uh, this also applies to young, as you can see here, the adorable little fawn, you can still see the spots. Um, beautiful little white-tailed deer um, left alone. Uh, and oftentimes you'll see this hiking or even around your neighborhood. Um, deer or rabbits, young, will be left on their own for certain periods of time. But this doesn't mean that they were abandoned by their parents. Um, oftentimes the parents will leave their young um, to go forage and return with food. And uh, deer especially will instruct the young to um, leave if they're startled or to stay put if they're startled and they will go into this kind of almost hibernative state and just lay there and maybe even appear to be dead um, but that is totally natural and the parents will return and recover the young when they feel it's safe to do so. It's very important to not approach or move these young, small animals if you were to encounter them. Okay, insects. Um, gonna go ahead and do a quick disclaimer. Um, this applies to all the animal, animal categories we're going over today, but there are way too many insects to cover all of them or do them, even try to do them justice. So we're gonna go over a couple of them, um, so very important ones, and uh, we're gonna keep everything rolling. So of course you've got bees, Everyone loves to hate mosquitoes, you know, dragonflies, praying mantis, and many, many more examples of insects in our area. Dragonflies, beautiful little insects. Um, they've existed for over 30, 300 million years. And prehistoric dragonflies have wingspans up to two and a half feet, which is pretty hard to, th to imagine, but it would be Pretty crazy to see a dragonfly of that size nowadays. Bees, one of the most important uh, insects to our ecosystem and to the environment and society today. Um, they are vital to our food production. Uh, the most prevalent and important pollinator around uh, about a I've seen estimates of a third to a half of all produced food that we consume relies on pollination from bees. 
and bees are very much uh, a threatened species at the moment. And it is important for us to support bees. Please don't uh, panic when you see bees or you know try and kill them or attack a hive should you come across one. It's very important to support and keep as many bees alive and thriving as we can nowadays. Um, there will definitely be links and more information on bees if you're interested. Uh, there's a lot we can do to help support them these days, and um, particularly planting uh, bee-friendly plants um, that attract um, pollinators such as uh, milkweed. Arachnids. Um, important distinction from insects, arachnids have eight legs and they are a different category than insects, uh, but this includes spiders and ticks as well as some others. Um, spiders, uh, another often misunderstood animal. Um, almost all of spiders in Maryland are harmless to humans. Um, their venom, while many of them have it, is specifically tailored for their prey, you know, other insects, um, small animals, uh, not humans. Um, very few spiders in Maryland can actually harm humans. There's actually only one native spider to Maryland that can be harmful to humans, and it's pretty rare to come across. Um, but they play a very important part in our ecosystem. And uh, like the bat, they are an important check on insect populations. They're the most prevalent predator of insects, and make, that makes them uh, very important in keeping those insects in check, keeping them in balance, and uh, not overwhelming, particularly us when we're trying to, you know, have a cookout in the middle of summer. Uh, the brown recluse is one of the spiders you do want to keep an eye out for in Maryland. Um, they are not native to our state, but occasionally they can be introduced from areas further south. Uh, they can catch a ride on some transports or be brought in from other methods, um, but they can be found in Maryland and a bite can be harmful to humans. Um, it will has the potential to create a localized MRSA infection. And should you um, experience a bite from a brown recluse, you want to seek treatment as soon as possible. Um, you can see a picture here on the right, and it's a little blurry, but you can kind of see out next to this arrow, um, there's almost like a violin shape right at the, the base of the head there, going backwards, and that's a good identifier for a brown recluse. Next up, we have the Black Widow, um, very famous spider um, and the only spider native to Maryland that is harmful to humans. Um, you can see the very identifiable red hourglass shape on the, on the bottom of the Black Widow there. Um, bites can be fatal. Um, they are not always fatal and they can definitely be treated, but uh, if you were to be bitten by a Black Widow, you definitely want to seek treatment as soon as possible. Ticks, another very fun arachnid. Um, they are very prevalent in Maryland. Uh, they tend to be more prevalent in the warmer states and less so in uh, cooler areas to the north, but Maryland is definitely a hot spot and uh, you will probably encounter some amount of ticks in your time outdoors, whether you're hiking or picnicking, um, it's just a matter of time before you um, stumble across one of these guys. And the three very common examples in Patapsco, we're gonna go over real quickly, the dog tick, um, the deer tick, and the lone star tick. Um, real quickly before we go on, and go over this picture on the right. It's a good example of the differences in sizes. Um, you can see on the bottom that dog tick is the largest, which is actually very helpful, makes them easier to spot and uh, quickly remove when you find one. The back-legged tick or the deer tick on the top there, you can see in comparison to a dime, is very, very small. Um, that makes them 
uh, kind of a bigger threat to hikers and uh, Patapsco visitors because it is difficult to find these without a thorough check uh, once you leave the wooded area. Okay, so taking care of ticks. Uh, preventing tick bites this is the first line of defense. Um, you're going to want to wear pants, long so socks. Um, even if it's warm out, uh, wearing extra clothing like this can help prevent ticks from reaching your bare skin and uh, getting on you before you notice them. You may want to consider a bug spray. Um, they have some bug sprays such as permethrin that will help reduce or, um, ticks. Uh, they can be sprayed on specific pairs of clothing and the effect can last uh, several months. Um, and you also want to avoid uh, heavy tick habitat such as tall grass. Um, there's no way to completely eliminate the chance of running into ticks while you're out in the Patapsco, out in uh, the forest or hiking, um, but if you avoid areas where that require you to walk through tall grass specifically, um, you can reduce your chances. If you find a tick crawling on you, um, such as the one in this picture that has not bitten or attached itself, you can easily remove it, just uh, pick it off, uh, you know, remove it with another object if you need to, um, but you can just remove it immediately. And if a tick has bitten you, um, they are difficult to remove, and it's better to not use your hands or fingernails. You're going to want to find a good pair of tweezers, um, grasp the tick right at the mouth, at the head, and uh, pull firmly and directly away from the bite uh, without twisting. Uh, it's an important part here is you want to make it a clean removal and not leave the head of the tick in or any other part. Um, once that the tick is removed, you're going to want to get rid of it. And just a reminder that squishing ticks actually does not kill them. Um, so you're going to want to either flush it or you know, just remove, make sure it's gone rather than trying to kill it. So first up here, we've got the dog tick. Um, very common in the Patasco. As I mentioned before, it's larger than other tick varieties. Makes it easier to spot. Um, Certainly still no fun to come across, but at least you can usually find them and remove them with ease. Uh, they are also less likely to transmit um, various diseases, uh, especially Lyme's disease. Next, we got the deer tick or the back-legged tick, also common in the Patasco. Um, these are very small. Uh, it is very difficult to find them with just a glance as you're walking through Tapsco or hiking. Uh, and this makes it very important to give yourself a good thorough tick check when you get home or when you're done your hike. Uh, you're gonna wanna find these before they can bite you or latch on. The deer tick is also notorious for transmitting Lyme's disease, which is no fun. So you're going to, again, want to try and catch these before they can bite you and potentially infect you with Lyme disease. Uh, the Lone Star Tick is uh, new to the Maryland area, but it has recently been spotted around here. Um, I actually came across one last year in the Patapsco and fortunately was able to remove it before it bit. Um, but it has a very identifiable white spot on the back there. You can see in the picture. Uh, and they're also uh, known to transmit an alpha-gal allergy, uh, which is a very interesting um, effect of creating an adverse reaction to any type of red meat. So it effectively gives the victim a allergy to red meat. Um, the effect isn't necessarily permanent and can wear off after a number of years, but uh, I'm sure I'm not alone when I say I do not want to try it. Uh, next up, we have amphibians. These include toads, frogs, and salamanders. Uh, bonus points to anyone who can spot the toad in the picture to the right, um, really flexing his ability to camouflage and hide in plain sight. All right, so first up, we got the American toad, very common in. Maryland in the Patapsco, 
I'm going to try and play this call for you real quick. Uh, just a quick warning, this may be really loud, uh, but I'll try and set it up right. So hopefully everyone can hear that. Um, it's a very common sound in Maryland summers. I'm sure plenty of you have heard this, whether you live near a pond or some access to water. Um, toads, American toads, are very effective at you know, laying their eggs and reproducing in any quantity of water and can actually um, produce, reproduce in tire ruts that have collected just a bit of rainwater. All right, moving on to fish. Um, we've got smallmouth bass, uh, sunfish, shad, American eels. Um, very interesting that eels are starting to repopulate areas of the Patapsco. They have not been present in for some time. Um, the removal of a couple uh, old hydroelectric dams has allowed eels to propagate further upstream than we've seen in decades. And that's uh, a very exciting um, find for our local ecosystem. You can see a good example of a sunfish here on the right, and that's uh, my good friend Chase presenting it, giving it a good sniff. We've got the rockfish or striped bass is the official state fish. Um, the rockfish often live three to five years in the bay, and then they move out to the ocean where they can live up to 30 plus years. Um, the uh, rockfish is well known as a very popular sport fish, um, often used in competitions and recreational fishing. All right, next up, we have birds. Um, just to reiterate, um, we do not have time to go over as many examples of wildlife as I would like, um, but we will definitely provide good links and resources to those who want to learn more um, following the presentation. So with birds, we've got herons, ducks and geese, uh, vultures, hawks, wild turkeys, owls, and woodpeckers. There are a lot of beautiful examples of all these bird species native to Maryland that we'd love to spend time with, uh, but we're going to go over a couple examples real quick. One of my personal favorites, the great blue heron, um, a very identifiable bird species um, with their great size and beautiful blue collar. Um, great blue herons have actually benefited uh, particularly well from the recovery of beaver populations in the uh, northeast area. As beaver populations rebound, uh, they're able to, you know, create dams and various streams and increase the amount of marsh habitat in wetlands areas. Um, that provides more food and habitat for great blue herons and their populations have begun to regrow and benefit from this as well. Um, Really interesting fact, despite their great size and wingspan, um, blue herons only top out about five to six pounds, which is super light um, in comparison due to their hollow bone structure, as all birds have. Another fascinating bird um, that is often misunderstood and looked down upon is the turkey vulture. I'm sure you've probably all seen them, oftentimes along the side of a highway. Um, and while they may seem less than savory to a lot of people, they perform a very important function both to our ecosystem and to um, humans in general. The vulture's stomach acid is incredibly acidic and even more so than a car battery. And this helps the vulture in digesting disease-ridden meat um, so from the carcasses of uh, rotting animals. And by safely consuming this rotting meat, um, the vulture helps prevent the um, transmission of diseases from these carcasses to other animals or humans. 
and provides an important check on diseases spreading through our area. Next up, we have reptiles. Um, in Maryland, you can find turtles and tortoises, lizards, and snakes, a very misunderstood category there, snakes. Um, another personal favorite, this beauty right here, the diamondback terrapin, um, is a really interesting species. It is known as an indicator species. Um, this is because diamondback terrapins, they're uh, very particular about their habitat and live in brackish water which is mixed salt water and fresh water. Um, this is pre present in the bay where the salt water of the ocean meets the um, fresh water of our rivers, including the Patapsco. And they call it an indicator species because when they find uh, diamondback terrapins, it's a good indicator to environmentalists that uh, you know the brackish water and habitat there is present and uh, can also show and reflect on the health of that habitat. Snakes. Um, this is a topic I definitely wanted to devote some time to because snakes are incredibly important to our ecosystem and uh, very much misunderstood and often mistreated. So we're going to go over quickly how to identify the venomous snakes in Maryland, um, how to avoid uh, dangerous snake encounters outdoors, and why snakes are so important. Um, so a quick couple characteristics of venomous and non-venomous snakes in Maryland. Um, the only venomous snakes in Maryland are of the pit viper uh, categorization. Um, so they share a couple very key identifiers here. So you can see on the left, um, the pupils of non-venomous snakes are rounded. Um, and then on the right hand, you can see the pupil of the venomous snake there, the pit viper. Um, they have a kind of a cat-like elliptical pupil. Um, moving down, you can see the non-venomous snake on the left has kind of a, a rounded head that kind of just rounds right into their elongated body, whereas the venomous snake has a very identifiable arrowhead shape. Um, this is probably one of the most important identifiers. Um, when you find a snake, um, you're probably not gonna wanna get close enough to really spot the pupil or get close enough to you know, tell the difference between that pupil shape, but from a distance, you can see the arrowhead shape on the pit viper um, category versus the rounded shape on the non-venomous snake. Um, moving on, you can also see on venomous snakes along the underbelly of the tail, they have a single row of scales as opposed to non-venomous snakes, which have two kind of overlapping rows there. Again, that's probably not something you're going to be able to see readily when you discover a snake you're hiking near, um, but in an emergency, should you need to identify a snake, maybe after a bite, um, that is an indicator you can use. All right, so what to do with snakes. Um, first off, just really want to ask people to respect them. Um, just like is, is in all wildlife in the Patapsco area and all wildlife outdoors, um, probably the biggest, most important thing is to respect them and give them uh, distance, you know. Um, there are very few animals out there that will do you harm um, regardless, and even fewer that will do your harm if you're giving them appropriate space and uh, caution. Um, one way to limit your exposure to snakes is to be aware. Um, snakes prefer certain types of habitat. They're often seen um, near rivers or creeks, and they like to sunbathe on rocks. Uh, and whenever you're near these kind of areas, it's good to keep an eye out, um, take a little more caution as you're hiking, and uh, make sure that you see a snake before you stumble upon it. Uh, never approach or antagonize snakes that you find out in Patapsco or in the wild. Um, 
I assure you that if you give it appropriate distance, snakes will not chase you down the trail. They will not follow you. They will only attack as an absolute last resort. So if you give them the right amount of space, you can uh, be sure not to uh, antagonize or draw an attack. Um, definitely do not attempt to harm the snake in any way. Um, snakes are very important to our ecosystem. Uh, they do, they have been villainized over the years, but they very, very rarely attack humans or even less rarely cause any harm. Um, and it's important to leave them alone, let them do their job in our ecosystem and not just try and kill them out of fear or to ward off any future attacks. Uh, snakes are very important to our ecosystem. They are, again, a natural pest control. Kind of seeing a, a pattern here of often misunderstood creatures um, being very important in controlling uh, other pests or animals that can cause humans actual harm. Um, they reduce the rodent population and keep that in check very effectively, and that reduces the tick population. Studies have shown that when rodents and small mammals are allowed to thrive in areas, particularly wooded habitat, um, that only gives ticks a, a bigger medium to expand and increased habitat, which you know can uh, propagate diseases such as Lyme's disease. Um, so it's important for snakes to be allowed to thrive on their own, share this habitat with us, and do their job and keep those in check. It's another reminder that almost all snakes in Maryland are not harmful to you, and even the ones that are venomous will only attack when threatened or, um, you know, practically stepped on. Um, they will often give you warning signs, and as long as you give them a good buffer of, uh, you know, six to ten feet, they will avoid you as well. Here's a good example of a snake encounter. You have a garter snake here. Um, just a little baby, but you can see looking on the right here that it has that very rounded head. It just kind of smooths into the snake's body. It doesn't jut out like the, uh, the arrowhead shape of copperhead or um, a rattlesnake. Um, here's another example of a snake along a trail. This is a black rat snake. Um, you can see from its position, if it's starting to feel threatened. Um, I had been walking and discovered this on the side of a trail and uh, was quick to back off and give it some space. But as you can see, it's kind of coiled. Um, this is a position that snakes will take when they feel threatened and it, they're preparing to lash out in defense if necessary. Um, but even if you are to find a snake in this position, just give it space. Um, if you give it space and leave it alone, uh, the snake will not attack you and will go about its business when it feels comfortable. It's a good example of another non-venomous snake. You can see the head at the bottom there just kind of smooths into the body. Um, but it's a good reminder that snakes are actually great swimmers. Um, and that is another reason why they like habitat uh, surrounding water, creeks, and rivers. Um, so yeah, just don't be, if you're unfamiliar with snakes, don't be alarmed if they will suddenly swim away or swim very quickly and well. All right, I'm going to pass the torch here to our program manager, Hannah Zinnert. Hey, DJ, you have to start my video for me. While DJ gets my video set up, I'm going to just start talking so that we can um, keep moving on with the presentation. But I just want to take the time to talk about how our human actions have impact on the native species and the wildlife in our area. Um, of course, not every human-based impact can be directly controlled by us at an individual level. Um, so if you look at that photo on the right, of course, there's roads, 
of course we drive on roads. There will always be roads, right? We need them to get places. So um, things like that, of course, we can't necessarily have a direct impact on. We can be aware of our surroundings, but these next few slides are gonna focus on things that we can touch on at an individual level um, to really make sure that we are making a difference in the ways that we can. Next slide, please. All right, so one of the biggest things is, of course, trash and litter. Um, and it's something that we tackled during our normal um, community engagement activities where we do stream cleanups. Um, but just keeping in mind when it comes to a wildlife perspective that um, wildlife can, of course, get caught in it. Um, we've seen plenty of photos out there of sea turtles and other, other critters getting caught in plastic and other nettings or fishing lines. Um, but that can really happen anywhere, right? So any sort of animal can, can, can get caught in the trash and litter that's um, left on the ground. Uh, wildlife can eat it, and this can be potentially toxic to their system, depending on what type of trash or litter. Um, but it can also get caught in their digestive tract. Um, it can block it. It can cause them to starve. Um, so that's another huge issue. Um, wildlife can be injured by sharp, broken litter leading to possible infection. So even if the injury itself doesn't, um, you know, cause them to die, it can create an infection with an exposed wound. Um, and that's another huge issue. And then finally, for aquatic wildlife, um, the, the trash and litter that eventually makes its way into the streams can leak toxins and chemicals into the water um, and really impact the health of their habitat. Um, so this graphic on the right I find is really powerful. Um, and it's a new campaign by Baltimore County. And it basically litter doesn't stop where it drops, right? So even if you drop some litter on a parking lot or it blows out of your trash can in your neighborhood, no matter where you are, eventually that trash is going to make its way into the stream because of our system. Um, and that kind of stuff gets consumed by all the different critters, as you can see, with that fish um, that's there. And it's really interesting because we eat seafood, right? So a lot of times there's more and more studies coming out showing how the trash and litter that these critters eat then make its way into us when we eat them. So something to keep in mind is, well, this is all, you know, hard to hear and it's really not fun to see trash and litter around, but what can we do at an individual level to make a difference? Um, and one thing we always like to say is make sure you leave no trace when you go outdoors. Um, there's a whole bunch of different um, steps that it comes to when it leaves no trace, um, but one of the most important things is make sure you pack in, pack out. Um, and it is a state park policy to pack in and pack out your trash when you go visit a state park, but this can really be applied to any natural space even if you're going to a local park or if you're just going on a walk around the neighborhood um, and you bring a snack to enjoy along the way, make sure you take that trash with you on the way out. And of course, if you're feeling extra determined, um, you can bring a bag with you when heading outdoors to clean up any trash or litter you may find along the way. Um, and another thing is when you're taking out your own trash and recycling at your house, um, be sure to keep a lid on it and take note of the weather. If it's super windy out, don't take it out that week. If you you know, don't have the need to, or if you really need to take it out that week, wait until right before it is supposed to be picked up. That way, the wind won't blow away a ton of that recycling and that trash, and then eventually make its way into the storm drains and down into our waterways. And of course, we can all reduce our single-use plastic consumption to reduce the amount of trash and litter that we are creating in the first place. Next slide, please. Great house, yard, and car care. So what we use and how we use it to take care of our house, our yard, and our cars can add more nutrients, chemicals, and other pollutants into the surrounding environment. Um, they can have direct or indirect impacts on the wildlife that live there, feed there, or reproduce there. Next slide. So the first thing I wanna to touch on is nutrient overload into our waterways. Um, this can come in the form of lawn fertilizers, household cleaning supplies, pet waste in our own backyards, or car washing soap that we use on our driveways. Um, all of the nutrients that are found in these different sources can eventually make its way into our waterways. It can over enrich them. It can create algal blooms. Um, if you see the photos on the right, these are some pretty um, intense examples of algal blooms that have occurred. Um, very often when an algal bloom forms, it obviously blocks sunlight from reaching um, water down below, but even more um, extreme is that when it begins to decompose, it uses up oxygen in the water and can create anoxic or dead zones. 
Um, these dead zones are, you know, that popular key term you hear when talking about the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and if, you know, the wildlife there can swim away, they will. Often these types of critters don't have the chance to get away. And when there's a lack of oxygen, it can stress them or kill them, as you see in that bottom right photo, unfortunately. Um, but it's really, really important. One step we can take as an individual is having smart yard care. Um, so when it comes to lawn fertilizers, we, uh, I know a lot of people like to have that lush green lawn. Um, but it's really important that you test your lawn to see if it even needs fertilizer because very often um, when you test it, you discover that you don't need it or you only need a certain amount or a certain type of fertilizer that has the right proportion of nutrients. You want to make sure you're applying only during the actively growing season, not before a rainfall event. So make sure to check the weather before you go out and do it and that it's the correct amount. And one other thing that you can always do that's really exciting and reduces your fertilizer use is convert your lawn to native plants. Um, this will reduce your need for fertilizer and there's so many other wonderful benefits that have come along with native plants in your yard. Um, we actually held a, another webinar on native trees and the benefits of native trees and native plants. Um, it's on our website, it's recorded if you wanna go take a look at that. Um, but that's another way to both beautify your yard, have wonderful benefits for yourself and the environment, and also reducing the need for fertilizer. And then finally, always pick up pet waste in your backyard before rainfall. Um, of course, you know, when we go on walks with our dogs, most or, or all of us pick up after our dogs. Um, I know a lot of us keep our dogs in our backyards, right? Um, so, and that's totally fine, it's great, but try to keep note of the weather and whenever there's a rainstorm, making sure that we pick up in our backyards before that rain can wash away the pet waste into a nearby waterway. Next slide, please. All right, another thing is uh, road salt and de-icer. Um, excess road salt can make its way into nearby waterways and soil. Um, if you look in that top right photo, you'll see a huge pile of salt right next to that storm drain and just on the other side um, is a stream. Um, and in case you didn't know, and some of us may, when things go into a storm, storm drain, they are not filtered. It does not go to some sort of filtering facility or stormwater treatment plant. It goes directly back into our waterways. So all that extra salt will eventually get right down below after the next um, rainfall. And chloride is very toxic to vegetation and aquatic wildlife. High chloride levels in water can inhibit aquatic species growth and reproduction. It can impact food sources. Um, and it can also disrupt osmoregulation in amphibians. I also like to show that bottom left photo um, because even though, you know, the water in, in the top right is going directly to a stream, water on the side of the road can also impact the vegetation there. So when you find trees like that that have that browning color facing the road, so often that comes from oversalting. And of course, um, people use salt on their own property. Um, so on a larger level, um, we may not necessarily be able to control the way our jurisdictions use salt, but we can make decisions on our own property when it comes to icing our driveways and our sidewalks. Um, so we can reduce salt use on our own property and follow proper application processes. We can use eco-friendly alternatives to normal salt. Um, and if you're getting really fancy, uh, we can also advocate to those local jurisdictions. So whether your roads are managed by a city or a town or a county, um, you can take your waste and you can talk to your um, local jurisdiction who manages these roads to use a more conservative application. Next slide, please. And cars. So of course, we all know that cars can leak gas and oil onto driveways and roads. And with anything else, this will directly get washed away into the storm drains after the first rainfall. Um, Car washing runoff can also deliver chemicals and nutrients to nearby waterways, depending on the type of soap you're using. Um, and it's a fairly simple solution. So if you find that your car is leaking anything, fix and maintain these leaks before it can uh, leak onto our impervious surfaces. Um, one thing about car washing that I actually didn't know about before I learned about this is utilizing commercial car washes is actually a lot better of a choice than doing it on your own property. Um, commercial car washes have regulations in place to properly dispose of the wastewater from the car washing process um, and many of them actually filter and recycle that water to be reused. Um, if you don't have the means to go to a commercial car washing station and you're doing it on your own property, um, use phosphate free soaps if you can and use them sparingly and away from storm drains so that it doesn't go directly down that drain and into nearby waterways. 
So all of these things, even though they may not directly impact um, the wildlife in the way that the salt does, can impact the quality of the water. It can lead to algal blooms. It can affect the, um, the basically the home that a lot of these animals live in. Um, just like we want to live in a comfy, healthy home, um, our wildlife does as well. So the actions we take on our own property can indirectly impact our wildlife. Next slide, please. Um, the last thing I want to go over is pets. We love them, we own them, they're part of our families, um, but they can have impacts on both the local habitat and local wildlife. Um, so I know I mentioned this before, but pet waste can be an issue when left unattended. Um, pet waste contains millions of bacteria, pathogens, it can also create excess nutrients. Um, something we're commonly asked is, well, you know, the native wildlife poop. Why can't my dog poop out in nature? Um, and you're right, every, every animal out there does poop. Um, but when we have dogs and we have our domestic animals in our home, we feed them with uh, food not found in that native ecosystem, right? So it's not like we're taking food directly from outside and feeding it to our dog and then our dog puts it back out there when it poops. We're adding that extra nutrients in the dog food from an uh, outside source. And then when they go out into nature to go to the bathroom, they're adding that excess nutrients in. Another thing is off-leash dogs in natural areas. Um, there's a, a multitude of issues that come along with allowing our dogs to run free in state parks, local parks, um, basically any natural area where the native wildlife is living and existing. Um, there's going to be native wildlife displacement, there'll be a stress response by the wildlife, there's going to be direct and indirect mortality, there's going to be disturbance of nesting sites, and there could be the spread of invasive um, so the presence of dogs can cause wildlife to move away, either temporarily or permanently, reducing the amount of available habitat in which the wildlife have to feed, breed, and rest. Um, animals can become alarmed and cease the routine activities. This can increase the amount of energy they use while simultaneously reducing their opportunities to feed. Um, repeated stress can cause long-term impacts on wildlife, including reduced reproduction and growth, suppressed immune system, and increased vulnerability to disease and par parasites. And of course, there's the direct predation by dogs um, or the passing of diseases. Um, and of course, you know, we already have trail systems out there where humans are walking along and creating disturbances in, in nature as well. Um, and this is not to say don't stop hiking, don't stop enjoying the outdoors. Um, and of course, we want to be able to take our dogs with us. Um, but just keeping in mind that we are already creating a certain amount of disturbance when we are on trails ourselves with our dogs on a leash. Um, but the second we let them off that leash and beyond that maintained trail out into um, the forested areas, that amount of disturbance becomes exponentially larger. Um, so just remember to keep in mind that when we have our dogs on a leash, we're able to minimize our impact that way. Um, and then the, just the last thing I want to note is the spread of invasive plants. Um, and this goes along with humans as well. So always check your hiking boots after you're out in nature. Um, but when our dogs run freely out into different areas, they can run through different vegetation, and seeds may get caught on their fur or their paws and spread to new areas. So um, it can definitely create a burst in invasive plants into new areas where they may not have been previously. Next slide, please. And that's about it. DJ, if you want to come back on. I'm sorry we never got my video working. I don't know what happened there. Uh, but at this point, we're basically here to show you the additional resources you can use. This will be added to the follow-up email. And if there's any specific questions, um, if we know it right now, we can answer it. And if we don't, we can look it up and make sure we let you know in the follow-up email. Definitely, yep. Um, we have a couple links right here. More will be included with our follow-up email and we'll send the slides out as well. Uh, but I would personally shout out the Maryland Depart Department of Natural Resources website has a lot of good information on native species in Maryland, um, particularly wildlife, you know, fish, birds, everything you want to learn to identify or learn more about that we may have mentioned here. Um, there's a good source on the Maryland Department of Natural Resources website. All right, quick. Q&A. Um, I think we have a couple minutes left before we get through the entire hour. Um, for your enjoyment, here's a picture of my two dogs uh, hiking in the Patapsco, Chase and Seneca, but definitely throw your questions in a Q&A section. 
on Zoom here, and we will get to as many as we can. Okay, first up, uh, Kelly asking, um, occasionally hearing about bears coming into Patapsco. Um, what does the park do when they hear about a bear sighting? Um, so yes, bear, black bears occasionally make it all the way out to Patapsco. They tend to do much better and thrive um, out in Western Maryland, um, closer to the Appalachian Mountains. Um, but occasionally a young male bear will be seeking new habitat and territory and make it to our area. Um, bears are particularly skittish. Um, black bears are very unlikely to harm hikers or anyone they come across. Oftentimes it's very difficult to spot one because before you know they're there, they see you and they are already running away. Um, the important thing if you want it for safety while hiking, if you're worried about, you know, a bear counter, um, which admittedly is very rare, if there have been reports, um, you may want to just keep making some noise as you hike. Uh, as long as you can alert the bear to your presence and not startle them, um, you can further reduce your risk, which is already pretty low, that the bear would uh, um, come anywhere near you. Um, next up, Jesse, best times to see eagles. Um, not sure uh, what the best times would be. I've seen them out in, uh, in the middle of the day before, personally. Um, bald eagles, great success story of environmental activism. Uh, Rachel Carson and her book, Silent Spring, have really led to a rebounding of the species. And it's really cool that we can often see bald eagles now in the Patasco Valley. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for those. Um, personally, I've seen them in the Daniels area and McKeldin area, um, but they love, you know, water habitat where they can find fish and food. I want to add on to that, that I, I know that Masonville Cove, which is located on the middle branch of the Patapsco, uh, closer to the city of Baltimore, um, has an environmental education center where you can view nesting bald eagles. Um, Granted, I don't know how different that is now with the pandemic and um, what their availability is like, but um, in general, maybe it's worth a shot of uh, visiting their website, Masonville Cove, um, and kind of seeing what they have going on. Maybe there's some virtual way of doing it. You want to take this one, DJ, or do you want me to take it? Um, uh, you can go ahead and take that one. Awesome. Um, Jesse asks, what are the plans for conservation efforts with COVID restrictions? When can we help again? So if you are familiar with Patapsco Heritage Greenway, um, you know that we do a lot of on the ground stewardship efforts. If you're not um, normally, during a normal time in a normal um, world, I guess, we would be engaging thousands of volunteers um, in community-based restoration and stewardship activities. So we typically spend three months in the spring um, and three months in the fall engaging volunteers in activities like stream cleanups, tree plantings, invasive plant removals. Um, we maintain trees that we've already planted in the ground for three years to ensure their survival. Um, so that's the way we're able to get individuals out and do tangible actions um, to both improve the health of our local ecosystem and ultimately the water quality of um, It's a great question to figure out, you know, when will we be able to get back out there to do these things. Um, I'm thinking we are hopeful we might have a fall season. Um, there will definitely be restrictions in place as to how large our events can be um, and what other um, steps we'll take to ensure everyone's being safe and distant during our events. Um, but we also have a, a really strong independent style program called our Streamwalker program. Um, this is essentially a way for individuals to go out on their own and conduct cleanups, remove invasives, report back to us. Um, and if you want to become a trained official stream watcher, um, you essentially adopt a section of a stream or a, a section of the Patapsco. Um, you get cool Patapsco gear, um, you're acknowledged as a stream watcher. But in general, if you want to just do, um, you know, offshoots of cleanups on your own, we have a Patapsco Pickup Challenge kicking off on July 1. 
Um, and this challenge is essentially a way to motivate and mobilize anyone and everyone out in the Patapsos who conduct independent socially distant cleanups, um, report those cleanups to us, and then there's going to be a leaderboard um, with different prizes. So um, you'll be added to our email list serve from this uh, webinar, and you can stay tuned for that type of effort. But really hoping at some point we can get back to our normal group events, um, or at least in a smaller capacity. All right, try and get to a couple more questions here real quick. Um, Canadian geese um, often come through as migratory birds. Um, some are actually even residents here in Maryland. Um, they're not particularly problematic. Um, I don't believe they're considered an invasive species. Um, oftentimes they're seen as a nuisance for pooping all over an area. And uh, honestly, they're probably one of the most aggressive animals we'll talk about here today. Um, so definitely a good example of something to give a uh, healthy distance be to as you walk by. Um, coyotes. Um, they are becoming more prevalent in our area. They're expanding. As I said, they're very adaptable. Um, I've heard of them uh, all up and down the Patapsco at this point. Um, you're probably less likely to see them in general. They are, again, very skittish. Um, kind of similar to bears, they, you know, are very much afraid of humans and uh, would not really consider us any kind of interest or prey. Um, so as long as they hear you coming, they're going to get out of your way quickly. All right, we're a little bit over our hour here. Um, Last chance, last call for any more questions. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up and uh, let everyone get on with their day. All right. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, we really appreciate your enthusiasm for the Patapsco and the Valley in the wildlife it contains. Um, we will follow up with an email that includes all of the above mentioned resources and other great ways of learning about all these animals. Of course, we couldn't touch on everything I would like to during this hour, but um, these resources can connect you to a lot of fascinating information about our local animals. Um, that email will include the slides and a recording of the presentation if you want to um, rewatch anything or if you came in late um, and we'll send that out um, this week. Thank you again for attending and have a great day. Thanks everyone.